This Talmudic debate highlights a question that religious and secular thinkers have been considering for millennia. When, if ever, is it appropriate to lie? A surprising number of ethicists have answered, never. Not only would they not sanction the sort of tactful words advocated by Hill, but they feel it is wrong to lie even when a life is at stake. The 4th century Saint Augustine, arguably the preeminent church father, is the most forceful Christian advocate of this position. He believed that, since telling an untruth costs a person eternal life, lying to save a life is foolish and unjustifiable. Does he not speak most perversely who says that one person ought to die spiritually, so another may live? Since then, eternal life is lost by lying, a lie may never be told for the preservation of the temporal life of another. Augustine's absolutist position influenced some very heroic Catholics to feel that they had behaved immorally because they lied. Father Rufino Nicosi, a peasant priest who saved 300 Jews in Assisi from the Nazis by providing them with forged identity papers and helping them blend into the non-Jewish community, was troubled by the deception in which he had participated. I became a cheat and a liar for a good cause, mind you but nevertheless a sinner, although I am sure that I have long since made my peace with God, and that he has forgiven my trespass. 3. Apparently Father Nikoshi, certainly a saintly figure, as I understand it regarded people who refused to tell such lies and thus save innocent lives as on some level less sinful than he. For the 18th century Immanuel Kant, perhaps the modern era's most influential philosopher, Telling the truth was a universal moral absolute that allowed for no exception. In the essay, On a Supposed Right to Tell Lies from Benevolent Motives, Tant contends that if a would-be murderer inquires whether our friend who is pursued by him has taken refuge in our house, we are forbidden to lie and mislead him. For Kant goes so far as to say that if you respond accurately to the would-be killer's question about the location of his intended victim, you incur no moral guilt for the ensuing murder. However, if you lie to the murderer and say that your friend is no longer home, but unbeknownst to you your friend has gone out, and the murderer had then met him as he went away and murdered him, you might justly be accused of being the cause of his death. For if you had told the truth, perhaps the murderer might have been apprehended by the neighbors while he searched the house and thus the deed might have been prevented. Thus, whoever tells a lie however well-intentioned he might be, must answer for the consequences however unforeseeable they were, and pay the penalty for them even in a civil tribunal. A reader of Kant's essay may feel that, emotionally, Kant seems to be almost as angry at the man who tried to deceive the would-be murderer as at the criminal himself. In her book Lying, the philosopher Cicela Bach points out that, according to Kant's ethics, a ship captain transporting refugees from Nazi Germany would have been forbidden to lie to the captain of a patrolling German vessel who asked whether there were Jews aboard. Five Bach's example is apt, for in no country did Kant exert a greater influence than in his native Germany. Yet a German who would have looked to him for moral guidance during the Nazis' murderous rule would have found himself forbidden to lie to Nazi officials in order to save innocent lives. The Hebrew Bible's view differs sharply from both Augustine's and Kant's. When life is at stake, the Bible depicts God as not only permitting lying, but even mandating it. For example, when God commands the prophet Samuel to anoint David as king in place of Saul, Samuel refuses. How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. God neither promises Samuel protection or tells him to speak truthfully and bear the consequences. Rather, he instructs the prophet to tell Saul a lie that his trip's purpose is not to anoint a new monarch, but to offer a sacrifice. Apparently God wishes to teach Samuel, and all readers of the Bible that one does not owe the truth to would-be murderers. What of the more common situation that most of us face when a life is not at stake, but lying will spare feelings? Imagine Kant at a wedding, speaking to a groom. What do you think of my bride, Professor? Well, it is clear from looking at her that you did not marry her for her beauty, and from speaking to her, I can see that she is not in possession of a powerful intellect. Then again, perhaps she is very kind. I cannot say that for a fact, of course, since I spent only a few minutes with her. Thank you for being so honest about your observations, Professor, but I want you to know that what you have said hurt me.
to which Kant might well have responded with words drawn from his previously cited essay, Truthfulness in Statements, is the formal duty of an individual to everyone however great may be the disadvantage accruing to himself or to another. Such an I don't care what the cost is fidelity to truth creates a very inhospitable dynamic. Concerning other verbal exchanges, Jewish teachings offer a wealth of advice on when and how it is permissible and even praiseworthy to bend the truth, and when it is forbidden. As an example of when not to lie, the Talmud offers the somewhat humorous example of Rav, whose wife would torment him by cooking the opposite of what he requested. If he asked for lentils, she gave him peas, if peas, she gave him lentils. When his son Hia became older and realized what his mother was doing, he would invert his father's requests to her. If Rav told Hia that he wanted lentils, the boy would tell his mother that his father had requested peas. One day Rav said to his son, your mother has improved, to which Hia responded, that's because I reverse your messages. Although appreciative of his son's cleverness, Rav instructed him not to do so anymore, because it is evil to accustom one's tongue to speak lies. Rav was willing to forego the convenience to himself that accrued from his son's lies in order to ensure that the boy grew up to be truthful. The contemporary implication is that we too should be very careful not to accustom a child to lying on our behalf, whether to unwanted phone callers tell them daddy isn't at home or ticket agents at movie theaters tell them you're only 11. A child raised by his parents to lie and cheat for their convenience will quickly learn to lie and cheat for his own convenience. The 18th century writer Samuel Johnson noted, If I accustom a servant to tell a lie for me, have I not reason to apprehend that he will tell many lies for himself? According to the Talmud, it also is very wrong for a parent to lie to a child. One should not promise a child something, and then not give it to him, because as a result the child will learn to lie. 7. When a parent promises a gift to a child and does not deliver, the child may at first be bitterly disappointed, but eventually will conclude cynically that this is how the real world works. The Talmud emphasizes how very wrong it is to lie or mislead a person in order to secure some personal advantage. For example, it is forbidden to invite someone to be your guest if you know that he or she will refuse, since your goal is to make the person feel indebted or grateful to you for something you never intended to do. 8. Likewise, it is not permitted to open an expensive bottle of wine and tell a guest that you are doing so in his honor when it was your intention in any event to uncork the wine. 9. On the other hand, if the guest drew the wrong inference and said, I am deeply touched that you served such wonderful wine in my honor, then the guest is misleading himself, a misapprehension that you are not obligated to correct, since doing so would come at the cost of causing him pain. Indeed, where one's goal is to avoid inflicting gratuitous emotional pain on another, Jewish law becomes remarkably tolerant of half-truths and white lies. For example, and as noted in Chapter 2, Genesis 18 records the visit of three angels to Abraham and Sarah at a time when Abraham was 99 years old and his wife was 89. The angels tell Abraham that within the year Sarah will give birth. Listening nearby, Sarah laughs to herself, saying, now that I am withered, am I to have enjoyment, with my husband so old? In the next verse, God asks Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shy in truth bear a child, old as I am? Compare Sarah's words with God's, and you'll note that God doesn't transmit her entire comment to Abraham. He omits Sarah's reference to Abraham being so old, presumably out of concern that such a comment might hurt or anger him. On the basis of this passage, the Talmud concludes, Great is peace, seeing that for its sake even God modified the truth. As a general principle, lying can be considered permissible when the truth can do no good and will only cause pain. Thus, if your spouse is getting ready to go to a party and puts on a dress or a suit that is unattractive and asks how she or he looks, you should respond truthfully. By doing so, you might well save your spouse from embarrassment. But if you meet someone at a party in similarly unattractive clothes and that person asks the same question, it would be pointless and gratuitously cruel to answer. You look terrible, even if that's what you think.
There are a few specific instances when Jewish tradition actively encourages lying. From Judaism's perspective, lef is almost always a higher value than the truth, so that, as noted, you certainly do not owe just the facts to a criminal who will use them to murder someone. You're also entitled to lie to a thief concerning the whereabouts of an object he wishes to steal. Particularly when you are dealing with an unscrupulous person, preserving property is sometimes also a higher value than truth, as we discussed in Chapter 2. If an individual asks you what someone has said about her, you're permitted, indeed obligated, to leave out negative comments except in certain rare cases. See Chapter 2. If the person continues to press you for information what else did he say? You're permitted, if necessary, to answer, nothing else. He said nothing net. The exception occurs when what has been said is more than the sort of passing annoy comment that many of us occasionally make about others and there is a compelling reason why the person needs to know what it is. Jewish law places one restriction on this rare permission to lie. No one is to take an oath to a false statement, thus committing perjury, which is specifically prohibited by the Ninth Commandment. To swear to something untrue, particularly when invoking the name of God, is never allowed except when an innocent life is at stake. Thus, from this perspective, truth is a very important value but not an absolute one, even if Immanuel Kant who, as far as is known, was never involved in a love relationship, never had children, and had a very low regard for Judaism, felt differently. While most lying is reprehensible who wants to be friends with a person whose statements you can't trust, or a person who misleads others to benefit himself, people who pride themselves on always being truthful sometimes use this as an excuse to become verbal sadists. In his autobiographical A Writer's Notebook, Somerset Mime conveys how a cruel truth, told solely to benefit the speaker, brought an unbearable consequence. A woman who had become pregnant during an adulterous affair waited some 30 years to tell her husband that the son he so cherished was not his, within days, the man committed suicide. Upon learning of his death, the wife, who was suffering from mental instability and had been told that her husband had died in an accident, said, Thank God, I told him when I did. If I hadn't, I should never have had another moment's peace in my life. I would designate such a person a malevolent truth-teller. She didn't inform her husband of her adultery at the time it occurred, perhaps because she wanted to retain the advantages of living with him, as he was a wealthy man. Instead, she waited decades until her husband had forged a very close bond with the child he assumed was his, not that she was suffering from mental instability, which may have made her incapable of enjoying her life, she wished to see her husband suffer as well. I would argue that telling the truth at the time she chose to do so was a worse betrayal than her original act of adultery. Verbal sadism is common and particularly harmful within marriages. For example, during a time of marital tension, a man I know told his wife about six different women he knew to whom he was more attracted than her, and how much he fantasized about sleeping with them. Likewise, parents who make it clear to their child that they prefer one of his or her siblings are guilty of such sadism. Not surprisingly, in the Talmudic debate that began this chapter, the tradition ends up ruling in favor of Hill, who advocates praising the bride, in deference to both her feelings and those of the groom. As the hero of Graham Greene's novel The Heart of the Matter says, in human relations, kindness and lies are worth a thousand gratuitously painful truth. Macro lies Until now, we have focused on micro lies the untruths we tell to protect other people's feelings or safety. My friend Dennis Prazier makes the point that while ethical considerations allow some though by no means all such untruths, it is impermissible to lie about macro issues that transcend the individual. Macro lies can be particularly pernicious. For example, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a late 19th century forgery, alleged that there was an international Jewish conspiracy to take over the world and plunge nations into warfare and poverty. The historian Norman Cohn has documented the Nazis' citation of the Protocols as a warrant for genocide against the Jews.
During the Holocaust, six million Jews, of whom over one million were children, were murdered. The Protocol's lies helped set the stage for their annihilation. 13. By contrast to the Nazis' use of macro lies, people who are motivated by a desire to mobilize large numbers of people on behalf of a noble cause sometimes tell macro lies. But the use of ignoble means to achieve noble ends often results in new forms of immorality. For example, impelled by the desire to rally public opinion against Germany during World War I, ally propagandists concocted tales of terrible atrocities carried out by German occupation troops. Soldiers were accused of tossing infants into the air and impaling them on their bayonets, cutting off children's hands, and raping nuns. These stories were widely believed and endorsed by, among others, the noted historian Arnold Toynbee. 14. While such lies helped unite citizens of ally countries and motivate their troops, they also stimulated anti-German hatred and occasionally provoked physical attacks against Americans of German descent. When World War I ended, it became widely known that although German rule had been harsh and deserved criticism, its soldiers had not carried out the atrocities of which the propagandists had accused them. Adolf Hitler was among the few people who thought that telling this type of macro lie was a good strategy. He wrote in his political autobiography Mein Kampf, the British and American war propaganda was psychologically correct. By displaying the German to their people as a barbarian and a Hun, they were preparing the individual Allied soldier for the horrors of war, and heightened his rage and hatred against the villainous German enemy. Fifteen more than twenty years later, during World War II, when stories again began to circulate of terrible atrocities committed by German troops, they turned out this time to be all too true. But many people rejected the reports, citing the lies told during World War I. It was argued that once again a similar kind of anti-German propaganda was being spread. Thus, an immoral lie told during World War I was a factor in discouraging people from believing true reports of Nazi atrocities in World War II. If more people had believed what the Nazis' victims were saying, greater efforts on their behalf might have been undertaken. Undoubtedly, the creators and disseminators of World War I anti-German propaganda felt that it was noble to lie on behalf of a worthwhile cause. They were wrong, however, and more than two decades later tens of thousands of innocent victims a well have paid the price for their moral error. People's tendency to tell untruths or spread absurd exaggerations or simply to be extremely sloppy in their fact-checking is perhaps most disturbing when they're espousing high-minded causes. An unfortunate example of this occurred in the late 1980s and early 19. Many feminists as well as others who were not feminists, including many who were not even women, justifiably felt that American society had put great and unfair emphasis on women being thin, and they regarded the eating disorder anorexia nervosa as one perverse consequence. Unfortunately, in their desire to grab the attention of listeners and readers and alert them to the disease's horrors, some leading feminist writers seem to have concluded that provoking and infuriating their audience was more important than fact-checking. In Revolution from Within, Gloria Steinem, writing in 1992, informed readers that in this country alone, about 150,000 females die of anorexia each year. 16 if accurate, this figure would have meant that more than 1 million American women had died from this eating disorder during the preceding seven-year period, that more Americans died from anorexia and from strokes, and that in any given year almost four times as many American women had died from anorexia as the total of all people who had died in car accidents. In 1992, 39,250 Americans were killed in car accidents. Steinem cited Naomi Wolf's best-selling book The Beauty Myth as a source for her statistic. The number of alleged deaths from anorexia, and the sufferings of its victims, had so shocked Wolf that she felt compelled to note that, although nothing justifies comparison with the Holocaust, when confronted with a vast number of emaciated bodies starved not by nature but by men, one must notice a certain resemblance.
Wolf, in turn, cited as her source the book Fasting Girls. The Emergence of Anorexia Nervosa as a Modern Disease by Joan Brumberg, a historian and the former director of women's studies at Cornell University. In a book that received four major awards and was hailed by the highly regarded Journal of Social History as a masterful blend of history and contemporary issues, Brumberg posited that these 150,000 annual deaths were due to a misogynistic society that demeans women by objectifying their bodies. 18 therefore, it was allegedly men, the creators of the misogynistic society that demeans women, who were responsible for the deaths of these tens of thousands of women, Brumberg attributed the statistic to the American Anorexia and Bulimia Association. The philosophy professor Christina Hoff Sommers, author of Who Stole Feminism, was puzzled by this statistic. If over a million women had died from anorexia in the preceding seven years, how was it possible that she didn't know many of them or even any of them? One wonders whether the same question hadn't occurred to Brumberg and the writers who cited her. As of 1994, around the time these books were written, fewer than 300,000 Americans had died from AIDS, yet obituaries for the disease's victims frequently appeared in newspapers. Very rarely, if ever, did one read of a woman succumbing to anorexia. A rare exception was Karen Carpenter, lead singer of The Carpenters. When Somers contacted Dr. Diane Mickey, the American Anorexia and Bulimia Association's president, she learned that its carefully researched statistics had been seriously altered, distorted, or at the very least, grossly misinterpreted. In a 1985 newsletter, the association had written that 150,000 to 200,000 American women suffered from anorexia nervosa. This figure represented the sum total of American women afflicted with the disorder, not the number who died from it annually. According to the Division of Vital Statistics of the National Center for Health Statistics in Seychelles, 101 women died from anorexia nervosa in 1983, and 67 died from it in 1988. The NCHS reported 54 deaths from anorexia in 1991 and none from bulimi or about one three thousandth of the number reported by Brumberg and cited by Steinem and Wolf, concludes Professor Somers. The deaths of these young women are a tragedy certainly, but in a country of 100 million adult females, such numbers are hardly evidence of a holocaust. 19 Today it is now clear that thousands of women an estimated 8,500, according to Johanna Candle, the founder and CEO of the Alliance for Eating Disorders Day annually from a variety of diet-related causes. 20. This is a tragedy of enormous proportions that must and is being addressed by organizations such as the Alliance. However, it is equally clear that the claim that 150,000 were dying annually in the United States from anorexia never bore any relationship to reality. Yet, unfortunately, once best-selling authors introduce such facts to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of readers, their data, and the conclusions resulting from them, become widely accepted. In April 1992, and Landers wrote in her syndicated advice column, Every year, 150,000 American women die from complications associated with anorexia and bulimia. The Knowledge Explosion, a university textbook for women's studies courses published by Columbia University's Teachers College Press also contained this figure in its preface. The spreading of such highly exaggerated statistics indeed, the distortion is so mammoth that the word exaggeration seems an understatement leads not only to excessive alarm about a dreaded disease but also to great anger at men. After all, it is men, and the beauty standards they have supposedly conditioned women to strive for, that are responsible for the alleged deaths of 150,000 women annually which works out to more than 400 deaths a day.21 in conclusion, macro lies and grotesque exaggerations are wrong, morally wrong. If you believe that telling such untruths or being very incautious in ascertaining whether your statistics are correct is the only way you can buttress an argument, consider whether your cause is just and persuasive enough not to have to rely on distortions of the truth. As Friedrich Hebel, a 19th century German playwright, wisely observed, one lie does not cost you one truth, but the truth. 
chapter 12 not everything that is thought should be said it so simple to be wise. Just think of something stupid to say, and then don't say it. Sam Levinson Not all hurtful speech is said by people who intend to cause pain, a fact that does not necessarily lessen the hurt. This was brought home to me some years ago when I was writing an ethics advice column on the website beliefnet.com. One of the very first letters I received was the following. Dear Joseph, at a party a few months ago, when I was barely beginning to come to terms with the reality that my two-month-old baby was born with a severe disability, I mentioned my situation to another guest at the party. She replied, you must be a very nice person I don't believe that God would give such a baby to someone who wasn't good enough to take care of him. I was stunned, hurt, appalled, angry. I thought, no, God doesn't work that way he wouldn't do that to me. I wanted to put her in her place but was too taken aback and, despite my fury, worried that I'd show my bile to someone who was probably well-intentioned. What should I have said to her? Did this woman have good intentions? I began my response. She probably did, I acknowledged, but what she unfortunately lacked was common sense, both about God and about another person's feelings. Analyze exactly what it was that she was saying. First, she supposes that she knows God's will. But how does she know why God sent this mother a baby with a disability, a medieval Jewish proverb teaches, if I knew God, I be God. This woman doesn't know God and isn't God. And if she were God, she might well discourage people from being good by making it known that the better they were, the more likely it was that God would send them babies with disabilities. Like many well-meaning but verbally impulsive people, this woman probably spoke without thinking without first considering the profound pain her listener was feeling and how her words might be heard. Or she might have been one of those people who becomes very uncomfortable with silence and feels that something must be said, even if it turns out to be inane or worse. I suggested to the letter writer that if she could explain to the woman why her comment was wounding, she might realize her error, apologize, and, most important, refrain from hurting people with comments like this one in the future. Perhaps, I suggested, she could have said to her something like this. I know you meant well, but you should know that your words hurt me. For one thing, the implication of your comment if only I were a less nice person, I would have had a baby without severe disabilities is a very painful thought. How would you feel if someone said to you, seem like such a nice person that I pray God will reward you by causing you to have many babies with special need? The truth is that this woman was mouthing what I would call a pice platitude. Her comment put me in mind of an incident recounted by the 20th century Jerusalem sage Rabbi Shlomo S. Ishwadron. Rabbi S. Ishwadron once saw a child get injured while playing in the street. He lifted the bloodied boy and started running to a nearby hospital. An older woman, seeing the very worried look on the rabbi's face, called out to him, Don't worry, Rabbi. Bod will take care of everything. As Rabbi S. Ishwadron passed her, the woman recognized the child he was carrying as her own grandson. Isaac, Isaac, she started shrieking hysterically, and she yelled after the rabbi, Is he going to be all right? Is he going to be all right? For many people, like this grandmother, pie sounding statements when other people are suffering cost nothing and mean nothing. It is like reassuring a person in desperate need of money, God will provide, or saying to someone who has suffered a tragic loss, whatever God does is for the best. When Robert Kennedy Jr. eulogized his beloved friend Eric Brainel, he recalled the message that Brainel had left on Kennedy's answering machine recalled the message that Brainel had left on Kennedy's answering machine some months earlier when Kennedy's brother, Michael, had died. Tell me where to go, and what to do, and I will be there. Fourteen words, all of them one syllable, but these were the words that Kennedy chose to recall in his eulogy. In brief, words other than the most basic aren't always necessary, and when they aren't necessary, they can be hurtful as in the case of the woman who felt impelled to offer a rationale to the woman who had given birth to a baby with disabilities. One of the most profound and most ignored biblical verses is from the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, which notes that there is a time for silence and a time for speaking. A time for silence. 
It is to such people as the woman who purported to know God's will that the following words from Rabbi Israel Salanter are directed. Not everything that is thought should be said. Sometimes all that is required from us is that we listen and empathize. That is the brilliance and I use the word advisedly of the Jewish law ordaining that when people enter the house of a mourner, they say nothing but wait until the mourner speaks. The visitor cannot know what the mourner most needs at that moment. For example, the visitor might feel that he or she must speak about the deceased, but the mourner, who might have been speaking about the deceased nonstop for several hours already might feel too emotionally overwrought or drained to do so at that moment. Conversely, the visitor might try to cheer up the mourner by speaking of a sports event or some other irrelevancy at just the moment when the mourner's deepest need is to speak of the dead. And of course the mourner might just want to sit quietly and say nothing at all. My friend Rabbi Jack Reamer was with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel when they heard of the death of the sister of their mutual friend, Rabbi Wolf Kelman. Rabbi Heschel insisted that they go to visit Rabbi Kelman and his family members immediately. We went to the airport, we flew to Boston, got into a cab, and went to the house, Rabbi Reamer told me. Heschel walked in, he hugged the mourners, he sat silently for an hour. He didn't mumble a single cliché, like how old was she, what difference does it make or I know how you feel you don't know how I feel. None of the clichés, he just sat there in silence for an hour. And then he got up, hugged them, and we left. I learned that you don't have to be glib, you just have to care. The guidance provided here to know when to say nothing applies to micro-events, such as the death or suffering of an individual. Maintaining silence or minimizing one's words applies equally when a macro tragedy occurs. Some people, a fair number of them clergy feel the need to offer an explanation for people, a fair number of them clergy feel the need to offer an explanation for why tragedy occurs, even if they have to contort one to fit in with what they already believe. In the aftermath of 9-11, the date in 2001 when Islamist terrorists murdered almost 3,000 Americans in New York, in Washington, D.C., and on four airplanes the Reverend Jerry Falwell suggested that God had withdrawn protection from America and allowed this attack to happen because the United States was permitting abortions, homosexuality, and secular schools. Falwell's explanation not only offered no comfort to people mourning the deaths of parents, children, spouses, and friends but actually made many people angry at a god who would punish people with such fates. Shortly thereafter, the Reverend Falwell apologized for his remarks. In a comparable manner, there were prominent rabbinic scholars in the aftermath of the Holocaust who, in effect, blamed the Jewish victims for their own suffering. Commenting on the large and growing number of Eastern European Jews who had become irreligious, one prominent rabbi wrote that God sent Hitler's demons to end the existence of these communities before they deteriorated entirely. One the cruelty and I would argue absurdity of explaining the Holocaust as either a punishment directed against Jews for their sinfulness or a preventive measure to keep them from becoming even more irreligious in rage Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, a prominent modern Orthodox rabbi. Now that the victims of the Holocaust have been cruelly tortured and killed, boiled into soap, their hair made into pillows and their bones into fertilizer, and the very fact of their death denied to them by Holocaust deniers, the theologian would inflict on them the only indignity left, that is insistence that it was done because of their sin. The bottom line is this. Don't speak as if you know when you don't know. Don't tell a mother trying to come to terms with the birth of a child with severe disabilities why God sent her such a baby, and don't tell people who have suffered tragic losses that you know why they have suffered such a loss. You oft ignored aphorism, think before you speak, is always applicable. Say nothing to another person unless your words will be healing, or at least helpful. Perhaps the smartest advice I have ever heard on this subject comes not from a religious text or a philosopher, 
but from the American comedian Sam Levenson, whose comment opens this chapter. It's so simple to be wise. Just think of something stupid to say, and then don't say it. Part 4. The Power of Words to Heal Chapter 13. Words that Heal and the Single Most Important Thing to Know About Them The most important thing to know about words that heal is not that they be eloquent, but that they be said. Gratitude If your friend did you a small favor, let it be in your eyes a big favor. To become adept at saying, thank you, one must first cultivate gratitude Hebrew phrase for which, hakeret hatav, literally means recognition of the good another has done for you. Sometimes gratitude can be expressed by simple, thank you, but other times it is expressed by a lifetime of devotion. The Pold Pfefferberg was one of the 1,100 Jews whom Oscar Skindler saved during the Holocaust. In 1947, just before Pfefferberg and his wife emigrated from Germany, he promised Skindler that he would make his name known to the world. Short time later, when he learned that Skindler was impoverished, he helped raise $15,000 for him, a substantial amount of money in the late 1940s. In 1950, Pfefferberg, who subsequently changed his name to Page, moved to Los Angeles and opened a leather goods store in Beverly Hills that was patronized by many prominent Hollywood actors, writers, and producers. He tried to interest them all in Skindler's story. On one occasion, when the wife of a prominent movie producer brought in two expensive handbags for repair, he told her, if you let me talk to your husband about this story, you won't have to pay a penny for repairing the bags. The husband came in, and Pfefferberg told him about Skyler. Intrigued, the man wrote a treatment for a film, but unfortunately no studio was interested in producing it. Pfefferberg was unnaunted. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, he continued to tell everyone he could about Oscar Skyner. One day in October 1980, the Australian novelist Thomas Kennealy came into his store to buy a briefcase, and Pfefferberg learned that Kennealy was a writer. He immediately started telling him Skyner's story and urged him to write a book about it. Kennealy listened attentively Pfefferberg's recitation. He agreed that the story deserved to be told, but added, I'm not the man who can write this book for you. I was only three years old when the war started, so I don't know too much about it. Second, I am Catholic and don't know much about what happened to the Jews during the Holocaust. Fearful that yet another opportunity to fulfill his 33-year-old va to the now deceased Skindler would be lost, Pfefferberg was not dissuaded. I was a teacher, he told Kennelly, and I lived through it. I will tell you everything I know. With a little research, you will be as educated as anybody about this period of history. As an Irish Catholic and notable author, you will have more credibility, not less, in writing about the Holocaust. On the spot, Kennelly committed himself to writing the book. In 1982, Skindler's List was published to international acclaim. Pfefferberg subsequently served as a technical consultant to Steven Spielberg's 1994 Academy Award-winning film of the same title. Promise that a grateful Leopold Pfefferberg, aide to Oscar Skyler in 1947, had at last been fulfilled. Man who also understood the meaning of gratitude, Kennelly dedicated Skyler's list to Leopold Pfefferberg, and Steven Spielberg, also intent on expressing gratitude, concluded his film at the Catholic Cemetery in Jerusalem, where he showed the surviving remnant of Skyler's Jews gathered around the righteous man's grave to honor his memory. Of course, expressions of gratitude are usually carried out on a less grand scale. The Talmud teaches that one who learns from his companion a single chapter, a single law, a single verse, a single expression, or even a single letter, should accord him respect. Fulfillment of this teaching, when the 3rd century rabbinic sage Rav heard that his earliest childhood teacher had died, he tore his garment as a sign of mourning. This act may seem exaggerated, but to one who appreciates the meaning of gratitude, it makes considerable sense.
If you enjoy reading and appreciate that much of what you have been able to achieve in life derives from your literacy, then don't you owe a lifelong debt of gratitude to the person who taught you how to read. See the story in the introduction about the letter that the Reverend William Stidger wrote to an elementary school teacher who had encouraged and inspired him decades earlier, which tradition ordains that a Jew should thank God with a hundred blessings every day. Although such a large number of blessings might strike some as too much, a person who habituates him or herself to reciting blessings learns not to take life's pleasures for granted. Not only should we thank God, but we should likewise not take for granted the pleasures that others have provided for us. The Talmud speaks of the second century Rabbi Ben Zoma, who was grateful even to people he had never met, but who had enriched his life. As Ben Zoma put it, what labors did Adam the first man on earth have to carry out before he obtained bread to eat? He plowed, he sowed, he reaped, he bound the sheaves, threshed the grain, winnowed the chaff, selected the ears, ground them, sifted the flour, kneaded the dough, and baked, and only then did he eat, whereas I get up and find all these things done for me. Pakeret Hatav means thanking the taxi driver who has driven well, acknowledging the waitress who has served you efficiently and pleasantly, appreciating the clothing salesman who helped you choose garments you will now be proud to wear, and expressing gratitude to the bank official who has fulfilled a complex transaction graciously. Of course, gratitude should not be restricted to strangers. Indeed, how much more gratitude do we owe to those who give meaning to our lives, our spouses, our parents, our children, our friends, our relatives? Rabbi Jack Reamer has shared with me one of his favorite poems, The Anonymous, Things You Didn't Do. Remember the day I borrowed your brand new car and dented it? I thought you'd kill me, but you didn't. And remember the time I dragged you to the beach and you said it would rain, and it did. I thought you would say, I told you so, but you didn't. And remember the time I flirted with all the guys to make you jealous, and you were? I thought you'd leave me, but you didn't. And remember the time I spilled blueberry pie all over your brand new rug? I thought you'd drop me for sure, but you didn't. Yes, there are lots of things you didn't do, but you put up with me, and you loved me, and you protected me. And there were so many things I wanted to make up to you when you returned from the war, but you didn't. In praise of praise a biblical law ordains, you shall not cheat a poor or destitute laborer. On that day of his labor, you shall pay his hire. The sun shall not set upon him, for his life depends on it. Let him not call out against you to God, for it shall be a sin upon you. Withholding payment to day laborers is profoundly harmful. They are not people with deep resources, and their very lives may well depend on it. Rabbi David Ingber suggests expanding the scope of this law. He notes that the withholding of compliments and affirmation is also very wrong. Of course, words of acclaim are not actual payment, but words of praise can become a tangible, spiritual payment. It has been repeatedly documented that though many employers think that what matters most and perhaps exclusively to workers is salary, employees consistently report that what matters to them even more is acknowledgement and appreciation. The Bible records that when Moses told his Midianite father-in-law, Hobab more commonly known as Jethro, that he and the Israelites were journeying to the land promised them by God and invited him to come along, Jethro declined, saying he wanted to return to his native land. Please do not leave us, Moses said. You know where we should camp in the desert, and you can be our eye. Jethro did indeed choose to return to his native land. But is there any doubt that he left this encounter with the greatest leader of his age feeling valued and fully appreciated? Another law in the Bible rules that one is obligated to reprove another when one sees the other person doing something wrong Leviticus 19.17. But isn't an upshot of that law that one should praise another when one sees them doing something right? If you are a person who writes letters of complaint when you feel you have received bad service, then make sure you also write letters praising employees who have treated you well. Is unjust and unfair to be quick to criticize, but slow to offer a good word. The withholding of praise can have other devastating effects. I know a man, Rabbi Harold Kushner writes, a successful business executive who works 12 hours a day, six days a week, to make his business even more successful than it already is.